Okay. Hello, it's Chapo for Monday, May 16th. And uh, let's just get into it with uh, this week's guest. We are joined by Nick Bryant, uh, author of The Franklin Scandal. Now, uh, close listeners of the show will uh, probably be familiar with, uh, you know, maybe some like a few veiled references to the Franklin credit scandal that we've uh, made reference to in the past on this show. Uh, But today we're doing a deep dive into the history of this. And I'll start here. Nick, uh, for someone who's not aware of it, if they come across uh, something called the Franklin credit scandal, it sounds pretty dry and pretty boring. But it really doesn't give, uh, just doesn't do justice to how truly nightmarish and uh, terrifying uh, this scandal and the, what your book is about. So I guess like in, in the broadest strokes for someone who is not aware or hasn't heard of the Franklin credit scandal or Larry King or Craig Spence or any of the, de- the truly nightmarish details of this story, what are, the, what are the broad outlines? Like if you had to describe to someone who never heard it before what the Franklin credit scandal is. Do you want a, a light rendition with maybe put on some light, happy music or uh, <laughs> uh, now give us the, the raw shit. The Franklin scandal. A story, my book is entitled the Franklin scandal, a story of power brokers, child abuse and betrayal. And it's about a, there was an innocuous sounding Franklin federal credit union, in Omaha, Nebraska, not affiliated with Ben Franklin, not affiliated with Franklin stoves, but nonetheless called the Franklin credit union. And it was a front for a nationwide pedophile network. Its manager was uh, Lawrence E. King of Omaha, Nebraska. And he had a fellow pimp in Washington, D.C. called Craig Spence. They ran this nationwide pedophile network. And at Craig Spence's home, which was in a very opulent part of uh, Washington, D.C., Craig Spence was a CIA asset. And his home was had a bunch of little cameras all over it. Um, and it was wired for audiovisual blackmail. And King would fly kids in to Washington, D.C. quite a bit. I've got a number of their, um, their flight receipts. And the parties would go down at Craig Spence's. And if politicians put themselves in a, or any kind of power broker put themselves in a compromising position, they would, in fact, be blackmailed. And what happened with, uh, the credit union is Lawrence E. King used the credit union as his personal ATM, and he was inexplicably able to stave off audits for about four years because a federally funded uh, or federally insured credit union should be audited every year, but he was able to stave off. And then all of a sudden, the FBI came in, and he was $40 million short. So the Nebraska Senate formed a subcommittee to look into the money because they saw that there hadn't been any oversight to the Franklin Credit Union in well over four years. But when the Franklin Committee formed, a number of social service personnel came to the came to the senators and said, there's a pedophile network. King is running a pedophile network. And the social services personnel had gone to um, state and federal law, law enforcement, and they were just ignored, completely ignored. And in my book, I show how disingenuous uh, state and federal law enforcement is. And this network was big. I mean, Epstein's network was around for 25, 26 years, most likely. This network was around for about 12, but I think it was much, much bigger than Epstein's. Epstein required one grand jury to cover it up. And this network required three grand juries. And I don't know if your listeners are familiar with how a grand jury works, but this, it's, a, it's a very important part of this story. When people think of grand jury, they think that the gods of jurisprudence have spoken, but uh, that's not the case. In a grand jury, grand jurors are just people that have shown up for, for jury duty, and they've been funneled into a grand jury. And there's nothing special about them. They've just been funneled into a grand jury. And a special prosecutor is chosen, and he shows the grand jurors the evidence that he deems is important. And there isn't any anything adversarial. So he can take the grand jurors wherever he wants to take them by showing them evidence, by calling witnesses. And this particular grand jury was very, very, well, all the grand juries to cover up the Franklin uh, network were very, very corrupt. Um, there was an esteemed New York judge said that special prosecutors of a grand jury have so much power over grand jurors that they could get them to indict a ham sandwich. So in this case, in, in Nebraska, these two grand juries, one state, one federal, 
they uh, didn't indict a single perp, and there were a lot of perps, but they indicted two kids that refused to recant their abuse. And uh, one was Paul Benassi and one was Alicia Allen. Paul was looking at 60 years from the state grand jury, and Alicia was looking at 160 years um, from the state grand jury and 40 years from the federal grand jury for her perjury indictment. So Alicia was looking at, uh, at, at 200 years in prison. And she was indicted when she was 21, and she refused to recant. And a kangaroo court sentenced her to between nine and 15 years. Now, it was very important that Alicia Owen be found guilty because they needed to sanctify the grand jury that said that the child abuse allegations were a quote unquote carefully crafted hoax. But they didn't say who carefully crafted the hoax. It was a bunch of young drug addled kids who had been repeatedly molested. I mean, they weren't carefully crafting anything. So Alicia all the dirty tricks that can be used in a court of law were used in Alicia's case. And she was found guilty. And now here's a kid, you know, I mean, and she was trafficked as an adolescent. She was found guilty and sentenced to between nine and 15 years in prison for perjury. And actually her perjury case was the longest criminal uh, case in Nebraska history. And the authorities really tried to destroy her. They put her in solitary for two years. And um, I've got a podcast. I've just started a podcast, and I told you. And Alicia is the uh, first person that I interview on my podcast. I mean, yeah, you, you describe this as a universe that encompasses the refined industrial destruction of children and its cover-up. Uh, you mentioned the Jeffrey Epstein Network. And, you know, reading your book, the similarities between uh, what Lawrence King and Franklin Credit were doing and their connections to uh, Washington, D.C., one can't help but notice the uh, staggering similarities between both the men involved in it and the nature of their crimes. And then, like, you know, secondary to the, like, unspeakable abuse of children that's going on here, uh, like, the, the thread that unites them is some staggering connections to the intelligence community in the United States. Could you talk about uh, Lawrence King, the guy who was, like, you know, the, 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 the main, like, uh, you know, pimp and, you know, d- d- human trafficker involved in this? Could you talk about his connections to uh, William Colby, the former, oh, no, sorry, uh, William Casey, the former CIA director? Well, King and Casey, Lawrence E. King and Casey were very good friends. Um, here's my hypothesis, uh, because the two primary pimps, as I said, were Lawrence E. King and Craig Spence. They were both in Southeast Asia during the uh, Vietnam War. K- King was uh, in Thailand, and he had a top security clearance. And Spence was in um, Vietnam covering the war for ABC. And both were inveterate, hardcore pedophiles, unrepentant pedophiles. And my surmise on how they came together is that they were prob- both of them were probably busted molesting kids in Southeast Asia. And at some point, they had a nexus with intelligence because... Craig Spence was definitely a CIA asset. And I wrote a second book about this called Confessions of a DC Man on the Politics of Sex, Lies, and Blackmail. And I get into um, the CIA connections a little bit closer, or the intelligence connections. So very much like uh, Epstein, the Franklin Network was definitely a, uh, an outlet for intelligence to compromise people. And, and here's the thing. These... U.S. attorneys in both the Franklin Credit Union scandal and and the Epstein scandal, these U.S. attorneys were told to stand down. And and there's only two people that have the power in the United States to tell a U.S. attorney to stand down. That is the attorney general and uh, the president of the United States. So that's the kind of power that was deployed to cover up not only the Franklin network, but but also the, the Epstein network. And then, like, uh, like you also describe, like, you know, uh, uh, Craig Spence's house being, you know, like wired for video and sound as just like a huge blackmail network where it was just like not just about, you know, catering to the um, just like, you know, evil predilections of powerful men, but it's also about controlling powerful men. And you describe this as kind of an invisible system of like the real system of checks and balances in, in our government about like, you know, like, like, like who gets to do what and like who has what on whom. Yes, actually, I just wrote a blog this morning uh, called uh, "Sexual Political Blackmail: A Time Honored uh, Tradition in the in America." And Americans have a very collective naivete about sexual political blackmail. It's disheartening, but it's 
it, it's so absurd, this naivete. Um, I'll give you an example of a sexual political blackmail that's never come out or that's recently come out is um, there was a muckraking journalist who found out that uh, Alexander Hamilton um, had a 23-year-old ma- mistress who was married and, and her husband was shaking Alexander Hamilton down. So this muckraker outed Hamilton and Hamilton and Jefferson had a lot of antipathy. And this muckraker thought that since he had outed Hamilton's little uh, blackmail and uh, his predilection for this younger, much younger married woman, that Jefferson would certainly give him a political appointment when Jefferson became president. But Jefferson did not. And he nonetheless tried to blackmail Jefferson. And then, and then he outed Jefferson for having sex with one of his slaves, uh, Sally Hemings. So sexual political blackmail has been going on forever and ever. And I can give you two examples of uh, guys that were obviously blackmailed. One is uh, Larry Craig. He was a uh, really far right wing guy from Idaho. And uh, he, he was in Washington, D.C. for 25 years. He was there as a, as, a U, as a representative, and then he was there as a, a U.S. senator. Now, this guy had a runaway libido. As I said earlier, I wrote a book called Confessions of a D.C. Madam. And, and Craig was getting male prostitutes from Henry Vincent, who ran this escort service. And then there was a film called Outrage made by Kirby Dick, where it showed that Craig was getting escorts from other services, too. And then Craig was tried to pick up a uh, vice police officer in a bathroom at a Minneapolis airport. Here's an esteemed senator trying to pick up a um, trying to pick up a vice squad cop in a in an airport. And it's kind of funny. I'm from Minneapolis and I go I go home at probably once or twice. At, well, about once every year or so. And um I was, I guess the guy was slapping his foot and, and that's kind of a signal for the wide stance. It was the yes, famous yes. wide stance. So I was, uh, I was sitting on the throne and some guy was slapping his foot on the ground. And I, I really felt bad for him. I thought he had a neurological disorder. So I, I, I obviously didn't understand the nuances of that kind of interaction, but Larry Craig certainly did. Now, how could Larry Craig not be compromised? How could he not be compromised? And then to add insult to injury, for us, he had the worst voting record for gay rights, I believe, in the Senate at the time. And then there's Dennis Hastert, our former um, our former Speaker of the House. Now, constitutionally, Dennis Hastert was the third most powerful man in the country. If the president goes and the vice president goes, the Speaker of the House takes over. So Dennis Hastert had... Uh, had a history of molesting boys. He, he had a 40-year history of molesting boys. And there was a FBI whistleblower named Sibel Edmonds who came across um, some intelligence on Haster going to a house of ill repute in Chicago. Well, he was Speaker of the House. So the FBI knew what he was up to while he was Speaker of the House. So how could he not be compromised? And it's very interesting when you start digging into this type of stuff. I have um, I have it it might be like kind of a general question and like kind of an impossible one to answer because you really have to get inside the heads of very disparate types of people. But, you know, I'm I'm from Chicago and, you know, like everyone in Cook County, at least uh, always hated Dennis Hastert. I think like most people ended up agreeing. But um. The allegations against him from the time he was a wrestling coach to, you know, up, up until he was speaker, really uh, surprised me because I, I don't think I, anyone in Illinois who didn't know would have pegged him as doing that. It just it didn't seem true to the type of guy he was, he, but it turned out to be who he was. But do you think that there is like it, this is kind of a chicken and egg problem, right? Like, do you think that the, these guys are most of the time, like legitimately pedophiles, like they're legitimately into this? Or do you think it's like an exercise of power? Like that they're, they're not so much like sexually interested in it, but they're like, okay, I, I think I'm above everyone in all these ways. What else can I get away with? I can uh, answer that question to a certain degree. Um, when I was getting into this, when I was uh, working on the Franklin scandal, I got to a blackmail photographer uh, for that network. And 
I said to him, how does this work? He says, it's like you're on a yacht and it's a beautiful day and you can have whatever you want on this yacht, whatever you want. But if you decide to get off the yacht, the people on the yacht are going to make sure that you drown. So what he meant by that is that if you're on the yacht, if you're compromised, I mean, I know of examples of compromised politicians were being compromised helped their career exponentially. So that that's one thing. Um, I think that to run in today's uh, political si- with today's political system, um, one almost has to be somewhat pathological. I'm not saying that all our politicians are pathological, but then you add this potent uh, this potent psychological alchemy of of lust and power and arrogance, and nothing makes people stupid like lust power and arrogance. Um, nothing. I mean, if you want to see a really smart guy get really stupid, put a beautiful young woman in front of him and then, you know, and then you could just watch it unfold. So I think that some of these guys, I, I, Dennis Hastert obviously had been a pedophile for quite some time. Yeah. Um, and I think that his pedophilia helped his political career. Um, like I said, i see, I've, I see that happening with other people because I had to try to get my mind around that, too. I, I didn't understand it. And I talked to a um, psychologist in uh, Washington, D.C., who works with some of these guys. Most of these guys are completely cool with what, molesting children, but some of them actually have the pangs of conscience. And she said sometimes it's a forbidden fruit syndrome, too, where you've got guys that can eat steak whenever they want. So they ultimately end up going for forbidden fruit. So. I hope that that kind of answers your question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I I think it's like kind of like an impossible to answer question because you really you have to do this impossible task of getting inside someone's head and you have to do it with like, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people. Can you talk a little bit about how you got um, sort of interested and like involved in investigating this, like, you know, really uh, the, this this odyssey of evil and corruption? I mean, the, the it's like sort of the, the book, like the entry point to it is when you were sort of intrigued by a like an editor or publisher to start looking into like you know uh, like like satanic cults and things like that and you became across um uh, this group called the finders could you talk about the finders and like how that was like your sort of entry point into franklin credit okay so here's what happened i was speaking to a rolling stone editor one day and he said pitch me dark stories and you know i just kind of reflexively threw my hands up in the air and said um uh, um, Nazi Satanist. My next step was going to be werewolves and vampires. <laughs> I didn't know where it was coming from. And then there was that little glint. You can see him in editor's eyes occasionally. And he goes, Satanists, write me an article on Satanists. So I uh, ended up interacting with uh, various Satanists from various satanic sects. And while you're researching a subject, at least for me, I, li- I like to do a lot of deep research to see if there's anything that's that's interesting that I could have missed if I didn't go deep on it. And I ultimately came across um, a U.S. Customs report on a cult called the Finders. And two of the Finders were dressed very nicely, and they had six kids with them in uh, Tallahassee, Florida. And a concerned citizen called the police and and said that, there might be child abuse going on. And the kids were like feral. Um, they were only allowed to eat as a reward. Um, they were uh, outside. And there's a woman named Elizabeth Voss who has written a, a nice three-part series on the finders uh, because a lot of documentation about the finders was just uh, released last year. It tried to cover it up. and She did a nice job of looking uh, between the lines. And w- with the finders, the U.S. Customs got involved because U.S. Customs has a branch that's anti-child pornography. Um, and they executed a search warrant on the finder's warehouse, and they came across pretty mind-boggling stuff. I mean, um, they came across uh, pictures of nude kids, um, quote-unquote, appearing to accent the child's genitals. Uh, they came across kids disemboweling, uh, uh, disemboweling a goat. They came across a telex said that 
two kids were going to be purchased in Hong Kong and that someone in the embassy um, would facilitate the purchasing of two kids. And there was all these different ways to get kids. And there was something truly nefarious about all this. And then on the the last page of this U.S. Customs report, Ramon Martinez, the U.S. Customs officer, um, reports to the Washington, D.C. police who helped execute the warrant. And the police officer was only willing to speak to him with anonymity. And he said that uh, the CIA has uh, taken this investigation over and there will be no more investigation on the finders. And then the finders were let out of jail and all their child abuse charges were dropped. And then all of a sudden in the Washington Post, we read about the finders being a a cult of peace, love, and brown rice. And I read that and I kind of thought I knew how the world worked at that point. I, I mean, I knew that the CIA was involved in like Guatemala and Chile and uh, Iran. I mean, whenever the interests of uh, multinational corporations were in, were jeopardized because of uh, a socialist or semi-socialist uh, president or dictator taking over that particular country, I, I mean, I knew I knew that the CIA acted. And I was aware of some other stuff, but that really, uh, that was it. I, I said, what have I missed in life? that the CIA is covering up for a bunch of uh, nefarious people that are, that are abusing children. I mean, what, what have I missed? So that was the thing that, that started my odyssey, and I tried to get as much information on the finders as I possibly could, but, but nobody was really talking about the finders. The Washington Post had interviewed this psychologist about the finders, and he offered these deep anthropological insights into the finders as if he was, um, you know, tracking some strange animal on the plains of the Serengeti. So I got his number and I called him up and I said, my name is Nick Bryant. I'm a writer. I'm researching the finders. And this guy said, no, 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 no comment. And uh, so obviously something had happened to him between the time that I talked to him and between the time he talked to the Washington Post. And everybody was shut down. Ramon Martinez wouldn't talk about it. Um, I could not get any kind of documentation. Years later, I would get the Tallahassee police report where a doctor said that two of the uh, kids had been sexually abused. But then I heard about Franklin, um, about that network possibly having ties to the CIA. That And that's what led me to uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Okay, so like in in in, in Omaha, Nebraska, Franklin Credit, uh, this guy uh, Lawrence King. Okay, can you talk about like who is this guy? Where did he come from? And like how did he rise to the the like to the heights of power and running this this unspeakable criminal network of like I said, yeah, evil and child abuse. Well, that's the thing. Um, I commented a, on it a little bit earlier. Lawrence King was uh, born into a very blue collar family. Uh, his father worked at one of the slaughterhouses in um, in Omaha, and he grew up seemingly uh, a normal person, but he had a top security clearance and he was sent to, um, and there isn't really, uh, prior to that, I, there's nothing that really sticks out as, as major malfeasance, criminality, or pedophilia. Now, I could have missed something on him. Um, that's entirely possible, but but when he comes back, from Southeast Asia. And the same thing with Spence. When both of them come back from Southeast Asia, their careers start to skyrocket. With the uh, Franklin Credit Union, um, King got Warren Buffett's wife to kick in, um, I think, $1.5 million, but don't quote me on, on the money. So although Warren Buffett would disavow their, any kind of relationship, his wife did, in fact, give the Franklin Credit Union money. So because, and this is what I believe, and I've been at this for about 20 years, King was a pedophile, uh, just a straight up pedophile. And I think that started to um, work for this very shadowy, malignant intelligence network that traffics children and blackmails politicians. The, the, the same is true with Epstein. Epstein came from a uh, blue collar background in, um, in Coney Island. He was, he was a college dropout. But at some point, his career just kind of skyrocketed too. 
and and I think that both can be traced to their to their pandering of ch- children for intelligence. Yeah, I mean, I like the the the, the like the similarities between King and Epstein are are quite stark. And I'm thinking about a a, a quote in your book. Uh, uh, I believe when like uh, talking to one of the uh, the the victims, uh, a guy uh, Rogers, I believe, uh, he conveyed to his sister and brother-in-law a rather mind-boggling account of that power. Power brokers had the code juice to completely erase people's backgrounds and insert them into high-ranking political positions, and like that immediately immediately made me think of Epstein, a guy who, you know, a high school graduate who out of nowhere becomes like a, a math professor at one of New York City's most prestigious private schools, and then and then is given. Uh, you know, like uh, put in charge of managing an astonishing amount of money in a private wealth fund uh, because he's supposedly a math genius. But like, yeah, like there's, there's just these huge gaps and like like this uh, questions that are uh, have to be asked about like who, are, who are, like who are these seemingly no, like seeming nobodies who are suddenly um, inserted into positions of such prominence and power? Well, I think that nobodies are tro- chosen for a particular reason because um, you can get rid of them. They're disposable to uh, their masters uh, in intelligence. If you had someone who is from a famous family, um, a family with power, there could be some blowback. But with someone like King or Spence, Spence was also from a blue collar family too. Someone like King, Spence, or Epstein from uh, a blue collar family, uh, there's not gonna be any blowback if they turn up dead, which uh, Spence and Epstein both turned up dead. Apparent suicides. And then King kept his mouth shut, and he was put in a, a psychiatric institution, um, first in Springfield, Missouri, um, and then ultimately in Rochester, Minnesota, where he did he had to do time. He had to do ten years for his financial crimes. He wasn't uh, th- there wasn't any child abuse uh, indictments against him whatsoever. So he did ten years, and then he had a no show job at a BMW dealership in uh, in Virginia when he got out. With King and Epstein, and I, I know a little bit more about uh, Epstein's like pre Black Ring days, just because of the extent of the coverage on it and uh, how it's like a, a little more recent. But I mean, the the weird thing with Epstein is how early it started, right? I mean, he was a college dropout who is pretty early on. There was some weird shit going on because William Barr's father. Yes. allowed him to be a math teacher at yeah one of Manhattan's most prestigious private schools and so probably pretty early on he was spotted if not like institutionally by like an individual who had similar like fucked up proclivities but um i think i thought it was interesting what you said about someone with a blue collar background can be discarded more easily do you think there are like i mean again this is uh, another thing that would be really hard to determine but do you think there are instances where you know, they start someone out on this path or like maybe maybe not fully elucidating it, but, you know, they give someone a leg up like they did Epstein with his math job and then his Bear Stearns job or King with his credit union. And then, you know, it doesn't work out for whatever reason. And then they just, yeah, discard them before the world ever knows their name. My surmise on that is uh, they get busted molesting a kid. Mm-hmm. And then at that point, someone in intelligence can see that they have talents and, um, and, and then take those talents and the pedophilia and then point it in a direction that can be used by intelligence. That's my, and I've been at this, uh, I've been in this, you know, this, this underworld for 20 years. And that's what I believe, um, goes on is that, uh, some people will get busted and the thing about it is the, the CIA has had, and we know about this, Operation Midnight Climax, has had safe houses in both uh, New York and also in, uh, in San Francisco with hidden cameras um, where people would be blackmailed. Um, they would go there. It was like a, it was ostensibly a brothel. And people would, would go there and the CIA people would drug them and do other things to them. And then most of these guys had no recourse because they were married and uh, they, they didn't want to blow their lives up. So the CIA with hidden cameras and blackmailing people, it's been around for a very, very long time. Political, like I said um, early on, sexual political blackmail in the United States goes back as far as you know, the United States. Um, 
and what's kind of interesting about this, I mean, J. Edgar Hoover was a blackmailer par excellence, and he was probably being blackmailed too. But he accumulated all that power because you can destroy someone's life. A politician has zero incentive to come forward and say, I molested a kid and I'm being blackmailed. Zero incentive, because that would completely decimate his life, decimate his family. Um, he would live ignominiously for the rest of his life. Um, so these politicians and, and power brokers are pretty safe marks to, to blackmail. And the one thing that people miss about all this is that, like, Craig Spence was much more of a blackmail artist than King. I mean, King set it all up and King did his share of blackmail, but a lot of it was done at Craig Spence's home in, a, um, in Washington, D.C. Now, Epstein had hidden cameras in his house in Florida. He had hidden cameras in his house in uh, New York. He had hidden cameras in on his island. And if you look at the people in the Black Book, I managed to get a copy of the Black Book and I put it up on the internet in 2015. Um, if you look at the powerful men in the book, um, and then the same thing with Spence, like Leslie Wexner, Jeffrey Epstein was pandering kids to, to Leslie Wexner. Now, I wrote an article. If you want to really deep dive into this, you can read my article. It's um, published by the Sheer Post. You, you can type in Sheer Post, Nick Brian Epstein. I show that uh, Les Wexner has big time ties to organized crime. The person that does most of the trucking for him is an appendage of the Genovese crime family. One of the attorneys that worked for uh, Wexner um, was shot execution style, two bullets in the back of the head with the 22, like how the mob and the CIA like to do it. So Wexner has this history of, of, of mafia, um, of of being part of the mafia or, or being tangentially uh, part of the mafia. And if Epstein didn't have an intelligence, a large intelligence organization behind him, Les Wexner is just going to call up his friends in the Genovese crime family and say, off this dude. But because Jeffrey Epstein and that, for that matter, Craig Spence had a very powerful entities behind them, these intelligence entities that went to these perpetrators and said, you, you are compromised and that's just the way it is. And don't try to hurt Jeffrey Epstein or don't try to hurt Craig Spence because this will come back to haunt you. And these people have to be obsequious because what else, uh, what else, what else are they going to do? So, and, and that's a point that people miss on this is that if you're going to blackmail very powerful people, Jeffrey Epstein, as a, as a college dropout from a blue collar family, he's not going to be able to blackmail very powerful people by himself, but he has to have an organization behind him. Same with Craig Spence. Could you talk about um, uh, another, another one of the major figures uh, in this book here is a man named uh, Gary Caradori. Uh, he, was a, he was a private detective. Uh, could you talk about how he got involved in the case, uh, what he investigated, what he found out, and what happened to him? Gary Caradori was an amazing investigator. He had retired from the uh, uh, Nebraska State Patrol, who is dirty in all this, by the way. They, they help cover up this pedophile network. Well, every, just about every legal entity in, um, in Nebraska helped cover up uh, th this pedophile network. But Gary Caridori, he, um, he was a hard-charging private eye. He, he ran a corporation that was called Caricorp. It had over 200 employees. And he was one of the, the best private detectives in the United States at that time. He would dress up as pre as a priest. Uh, he would, you know, he had all kinds of costumes and his, he had a passion for finding kids that had been enmeshed in, in, in the sex trade. So when this subcommittee formed after the subcommittee formed initially to look at King's looting of $40 million, but then the social service personnel came to that, the Senate subcommittee and said, you know, there's a pedophile network uh, going on. So, the Nebraska subcommittee ultimately hired Gary Caridori. Um, and Gary Caridori was, he was a whirlwind and he was getting, he was finding new victims and videotaping them. He was getting, I've got like 200 flight receipts of Lawrence E. King's. Most of them go to Washington, DC. And that was, uh, that was because of Gary Caridori. He was very good at working the streets and he realized that the FBI was, was trying to set him up for scripting 
the child abuse allegations. I mean, that's how desperate they were. And with the Franklin scandal, and I also believe with the with the Epstein scandal, if if the dominoes had started falling in Omaha, they would have fallen all the way to uh, Washington, D.C. So it was imperative to keep that covered up. And there were a number of people that died mysteriously. But getting back to Gary Caridori, he knew that he had to find definitive proof of this pedophile network. And because these kids that had come forward, they were, um, they had been repeatedly molested, uh, given drugs. It's, it's kind of a perfect system because you take these kids generally from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, um, and then they're molested repeatedly. And then they're, uh, and then one of the carrots is drugs. So by the time they lose their youthful marketability, they're expunged by the network. And then they go on to commit crimes to support their drug habit. And ultimately, they end up in jail and thereby credi- uh, you know, hurt their own credibility. So Gary Caridori had, he had found a number of these kids. Actually, I've got his leads list. He's got 60 victims on the leads list. And, uh, and my job was to go around. He was an amazing investigator. Um, and I've got all his uh, daily logs. Um, my job was to find these 60 kids because these kids don't generally use, uh, you know, if you're in a network like that and you're expunged, um, chances are you're not using your social, social security number very often. But anyway, so Gary Caridori, the FBI was put, the FBI had his phones tapped. They were, uh, he was perpetually followed. He would set up meetings with uh, with witnesses or victims, and the FBI agents would already be there. Um, he realized that he needed to um, get some very definitive proof, and he went for blackmail pictures. And he met Rusty Nelson. Now, I've got five corroborations for this, that he met Rusty Nelson. He flew a Cessna to, um, to Chicago under the auspices of the All-Star Game, the MLB All-Star Game. And he was with his son. And there he met Rusty Nelson, and I believe that Rusty Nelson gave him pictures. I've got uh, five corroborations on that, as I said. And when he was flying back, his plane blew up over Lee County, Illinois, and he was killed and his son was killed. And he, throughout his entire investigation, he had this uh, atti- this leather attache case um, or briefcase, and it never left his side, and that's where the pictures would have been. And that attaché case or was never found in the uh, the debris. So, and if you look at my rendition of what happened there, I'm confident to say that uh, Gary Caridori and his son were murdered. Um, he he could not make it back to Nebraska with the blackmail pictures because, as I said, if the domino started falling in Omaha. They would have fallen all the way to Washington, D.C. Uh, also of note, uh, you mentioned uh, in, in the book that um, after his death, uh, the Franklin Committee, um, was, what was like, so the Franklin Committee was that was that was that a, a like a like a government body that was set up to investigate this? The, the, it was the Franklin a Senate, Senate. Senate subcommittee it was a Senate subcommittee. So after his death, they appointed <laughs> former CIA director William Colby, uh, William Colby to investigate the plane crash. Uh, what did he conclude about the plane crash? Okay, so this is what I've got. I mean, I, I put it in the book, too. Um, and this is kind of interesting. William Colby investigated Caridori's death. Now, he told people who were affiliated with the Franklin Committee, and he also told Gary Caridori's wife that Gary Caridori had been assassinated. But he wasn't willing to state that publicly. Now, William Colby had a very, very strange death. And... William Colby was kind of interesting as a CIA director during the um, the church hearings in 1977. Um, two CIA directors were called Dick Helms and then William Colby, who was then the CIA director. Dick Helms didn't say a word, but Colby surrendered a lot of the uh, the CIA's little secrets about uh, killing people and uh, you know, the mind control stuff, um, actually penetrating the media, all that stuff. It was it was called the family jewels. And, and Colby spilled all of that. And he was pretty cool with everything he did. And, and he was actually head of the uh, Phoenix program, which uh, assassinated uh, 20,000 or so innocent uh, Vietnamese. So he had 
uh, he'd done some pretty uh, ominous stuff, but I've been told that he, he had, he had re-embraced Catholicism and he was cool with everything that he had done, except he just didn't, the kids, the way, the way that the intelligence had used children. Um, he, he just couldn't reconcile that with that. And according to this source, um, he was, he was going to out the CIA for that. Um, now I don't know if the source is telling the truth or not, but William Colby was, had a very strange death. He went canoeing in April, um, and he was sick and it was a cold night and his dinner was on the table. So, um, and then... And then he wasn't found for about a week. And then they found him right, right where uh, you know, he'd basically dumped the canoe and he didn't have any shoes on. I mean, he was 76 and he's, he's going canoeing in, in really cold weather without any shoes. So um, that's, a, that's a suspicious death in my book. Um, now, is, yeah. is, is, is that because Colby was going to blow the whistle on the – the CIA's use of children. I, I just don't know that with, with Colby too. Uh, I will add that he also, he seemed to have been in the middle of making dinner and his computer was on like in the middle of some document. And I don't know what the document was. It seemed like he had, if he really did die, like just canoeing a canoeing accident in the middle of the night, he stopped both things he was doing and decided, well, might as well get a ride in before I fully finish making dinner. Yeah, his it's, uh, it's it's quite anomalous. Now, his kid came out with a documentary, and I think that there was a lot of estrangement there between him and his, uh, I believe it was his oldest son. And his oldest son felt it was a, uh, felt it was a suicide. Mm -hmm. But William Colby had remarried. Um, he seemed happy with his wife. They seemed to be in love. As I said, he had re-embraced Catholicism. I mean, that doesn't mean that people are incomprehensible and they kill each other or kill themselves for, for very strange reasons. But, uh, but yeah, William Kobe's death is, uh, is, is definitely an enigma. And I don't see how someone can draw a definitive conclusion on whether or not uh, he was, I mean, his son believes it was suicide. I believe it was murder. Um, people can draw their own conclusions. Right. It's not impossible that like, you know, he was in the middle of doing something and just, I don't know, got hit with a pang of kill um, guilt or whatever. It, it's not totally impossible, but it is very strange. Well, I mean, if you're eating dinner and you say, uh, you know, I'm not even going to finish this meal. I'm just going to go kill myself. That would be, you know, it's kind of abnormal human behavior, I would think. I mean, like I said, I, human uh, humans are kind of incomprehensible. But uh, but yes, it's it would be quite anomalous. Well, some people like lunch more. <laughs> Uh, Nick, uh, I guess like just like the uh, really the um the most heartbreaking and like really the 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 hardest stuff in your book to like to to take on and and really like um I don't know like just 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 take into your mind are the accounts of uh, the victims themselves and I'm just wondering like so as a journalist um you know seeking these people out hearing their stories like you know I mean which are which are you know really really hard to really hard to think about really hard to write about I'm sure. But like, how as a journalist do you, um, you know, find these people, sort of form relationships with them, but also as a journalist have to maintain a kind of uh, a distance or a skepticism? And then, and then certainly in light of what you just said, which is really one of the most horrific parts of this story, is that they are all in some way rendered not credible by the things that have happened to them. Because like, you know, in, 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 in all of them, as you might imagine, in various ways are dealing with, you know, have dealt or have dealt with drug addiction, mental illness, incarceration, so that when you put them on the, a witness stand or you reprint their story, it's not that hard for, you know, a, a defense attorney or the media or whatever to say, oh, like these claims are like these claims are so outlandish, you know, like the names that they're saying, like what they're what they're alleging is so unspeakable. But then like, you know, look, look at who the person saying it is like, I mean. Like, like, how do you how do you deal with that that give and take between the the human beings that, whose stories that you're recording, and and this horrible fact of what's happened to them, and and like a sort of a, a, a journalistic um, skepticism or or rigor. Well, I was fortunate getting back to Gary Caradori. He had a leads list that had sixty victims. So the victims that I found, except for one, were on Gary Caradori's leads list. So he had vetted them essentially for me. 
And it was up to me to find them. And as I said earlier, a lot of them don't really use their social security numbers too often. It was up to me to find them and then get them to talk. Now, sometimes I could find them and then they would talk to me that day. Other times I would spend a lot of time finding a victim and the conversation would last about 13 seconds. There was uh, Alicia Owen. It took me quite some time to uh, for her to trust me. Um, I mean, she had, was sentenced to nine to 15 years for telling the truth and put in solitary for two years. So she's very cautious about who she lets into her life. And now here's an intro. I'll give you an interesting anecdote. Uh, one of the kids on Gary, Gary Caridori's these lists was Rue Fox. And Rue had been a, a Boys Town student. I mean, he'd been in multiple foster care programs before that and been molested. And King brutally molested him when he was at Boys Town. And he required stitches, uh, which was done at, I believe, the Boys Town. The Boys Town is an incorporated city. Um, they have their own police force. They have their own uh, post, off post office. They have their own zip code. So, I mean, Boys Town is kind of like a closed system. So it's very easy for them to cover up uh, child abuse. And I could not find Rue. I looked for him for about three years. Now, I, I wasn't looking for him like full time, but if I had a little extra time, I'd say, I'm going to look for this guy or I'm going to look for that guy. And I was in Nebraska and I had like six addresses for Rue. He was quite nomadic. And um, I went to all six and I came up empty. Finally, I hired a private detective. And she found him, well, she found where his father lived. And I called up and, and she told me this guy has, is a very dangerous guy, um, very dangerous and be really cautious with him. Um, he's done 10 years for armed robbery and he's got a rap sheet that's like two, two feet long. So I called Rue. Um, I got his father's phone number. He was living with his father. I called him up. And he said, are you a cop? And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm a journalist. And he goes, if you, I'm, I'll meet you, but if you're a cop, I'm going to snap your neck. So, huh. And then we met at this uh, bar. To say that this was a sleazy bar would actually be kind of charitable. Um, we met at this bar that he chose, and I uh, ordered a cranberry juice, which I really felt like I was going to get E. coli or salmonella from. And I was there uh, girding myself to meet Rue. And all of a sudden, Rue bursts through the front door, and he's got two people with him. And I got up to say hi to him, and he goes, back here. So I'm in this back room. I definitely know where the exit the exit is because I, I know that things could get ugly here really quickly. And um, Rue said, uh, are, you, are you a cop? Are you a cop? And you know, I said, no, I'm, I'm not a cop. I'm not a cop. And then I showed him this documentation that I had on him where he had been at Boys Town, and then he'd been at this foster care home. And then at that point, he believed me. But he hadn't thought about that in many, many years. He said, you opened the wrong door, um, because he, he got very, very angry um, when he started remembering um, how he was abused as a child. So this is my last day in Nebraska, at least for this trip. I've been there for a while. And I said, well, I'm going to try Rue one more time, and um, <laughs> hopefully, I, hopefully I, I'm unscathed. So I, I go up to Rue. Um, he's working on a car in the driveway, and he goes, you know, I've been thinking about talking to you. Let's talk. And then I interviewed him, and the 12-year-old, I mean, his suit of armor came off, and the 12-year-old that was damaged really damaged, came out, and he just broke down crying. Um, he, he, he was that, that very damaged 12-year-old. And so that's one account of, I mean, and I've dealt with a lot of survivors since then uh, investigating Epstein. Where journalists make a big mistake is that, like, like with Rue, um, I mean, you open that up. I open that up. And I had to help him put it back together. And, and, and Rue was uh, shooting crystal meth and drinking vodka. And I, I got him into a, a rehab program. So when you're dealing with survivors, 
it's not like you're dealing with the average person that you're going to interview. You you have to be uh, you know cautious not only for yourself but but for them for them emotionally. It's 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 very important. We're seeing Julie Brown who broke um, the uh, of the Miami Herald who who did the three part. Epstein series. She's getting sued by two of those um, survivors, Epstein survivors. And um, what journalists don't understand is that you, if you're if you're going to open these doors and, and talk to survivors, you, you have an extra level of responsibility. And um, so, and I've tried to have that with 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 the victims. Now, Rue, we we kept in touch, but then he went back to where he, and I've never been able to find him since. So uh, his father's died. And uh, yeah, so I have, I, have, I have no idea if Rue is alive or not. I would, I would say if he was hitting it like he was hitting it, I would say he's probably not alive. I guess like uh, to, 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 bring, to bring it to the present moment, I guess like this is my last question for you. Like, um, like yeah, to, to read your book and then obviously like, uh, you know, to, to know what one knows about the Epstein case. I'm just wondering, what do you make of this current political moment in which um, accusations of pedophilia, grooming, and child abuse are becoming more and more commonplace? And I, and I would say deployed in an incredibly grim, cynical, and glib manner. And uh, accusations directed at teachers, even children themselves, or, or elected politicians. You know, on the one hand, like, you know, you, 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 read, you read about the Franklin Credit Scandal, about Epstein, it's like, it's it's not hard to believe, and in fact, it's actually like factually documented that, um, the, as we've just been talking about here, these networks of elite child predation reach to the highest levels of power in this country. People know about that, but now it's like uh, the, the, that accusation is being used, particularly by people. I mean, and 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 the Franklin Credit story. I mean, like it's reaching to the highest levels of the Republican Party specifically, and. And now, in this case, they're the ones that are, uh, you know, like the, the, the men in power are using it to, um, to, to slander uh, like gay people or their political opponents. Like, what, what do you make of the, 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 the uses and abuses of these narratives of elite child abuse in con- the contemporary media and our politics? Well, I mean, you've got the QAnon stuff, which uh, those people are definitely misguided. Um, absolutely. But then you've got the other side of it. There's an article in The Atlantic that talks about, all you know, child trafficking is fake. Um, and I wrote an email to that writer, all these, she was talking about all these fake trafficking networks. And I told her that there are trafficking networks. And the thing about it is these kids are, get so damaged um, when they are molested young. It's really difficult for them to have a decent life afterwards. But when you get into the numbers now, um, the CDC estimates that 25 percent of women and, and the CDC generally errs on the side of cautiousness. But the CDC says 25 percent of women have been molested as minors. According to the CDC, a quarter of the women in America have been molested as minors. That translates into millions and millions of women that are um, that, that, that have been molested. And the CDC says, I believe, six to eight percent for boys. But I think that it's, it's actually higher than that. But, it, but if you're going to go with those numbers, um, millions of people have been uh, sexually abused and they suffer in silence. There has been some abuse in my family, uh, not my nuclear family, but in my extended family. and. Um, you know, I've seen the kind of devastation that that brings. So to be in one of these networks where you're very young and treated like meat and repeatedly molested. And some of these, some of these sadists, some of these pedophiles in the Franklin network were sadists and some of these pedophiles in the Epstein network were sadists. And the mainstream media has decided that uh, 14 is the demarcation for the Epstein victims, even though um, I have accounts of them being younger than, um, well, there's, uh, there's written accounts of them being uh, 11 or 12, but I have accounts of them being even younger than that. So when you have that type of damage um, done to such a young person, 
It's very, and, and then ultimately generally results in dissociative identity disorder. And it takes a long, it, it, that, that is a long road for a person to put themselves back together. Um, and it, it's going to require a lot of, they're going to require a lot of help um, once they reach that point, that level of damage. Um, I guess kind of like a ancillary to that last question, um, less about QAnon, more about like the, the, the current like spat of uh, culture issues from the conservative side where, you know, it, basically like if a teacher appears to be gay, like at all, it's, it's grooming. And it's it is it's definitely like a concerted. The main thing behind this is to destroy public education. They they pretty much like said as much. Do you do you think that like any part of this is deflecting attention away from this? Because with with some of this new crop, like one of the guys who's very big on this this stuff, James Lindsay, is like repeatedly hanging out with people who were part of the Nexium cult. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with that. Do you think that there is like a, a a an acknowledged goal of deflection, or it's just the the main political aspect is the most important thing? Well, the thing about it is, with the Franklin scandal, you had uh, Republicans molesting little boys, and with Epstein, you had Democrats molesting little girls. The reason why these things stay covered up is because uh, people on both sides of the aisle are molesting uh, minors and en- engaged in. Um, aberrant behavior, extramarital behavior, and they're compromised. So that is their bond. That is their omerta. When I see like the James Lindsay's of the world, um, I definitely, uh, like I said, uh, I think QAnon is misguided. Um, James Lindsay at his best is misguided. But as I said earlier, um, 25% of uh, women in our country have been molested as a minor. So there's a lot of women out there that are suffering in silence. Um, so as a society, we can do better than what we've done um, as far as opening this up. And it is getting better, but I think we need to do better. Um, the Me Too movement was uh, was somewhat helpful, but the Me Too movement did not help uh, the Epstein survivors at all. The, the Me Too movement refused to help the Epstein survivors, which I, I just find completely mind boggling. But as a society, we, we have to get this. Uh, we have to work this out. We're never going to be able to stop all child abuse. We can certainly stop state affiliated abuse like Franklin and also uh, Epstein. And I believe this. If, if you can take one thing out of our society, if you, if you could take just one thing, if you could take child sexual abuse out of our society, the prisons would be, uh, wouldn't be filled. The psychiatric hospitals wouldn't be filled. It would, our society would be very, look very, very different. Um, I, and I, I truly believe that. Actual last question for you. If you look up Franklin credit scandal on Wikipedia, yes. you will go to a page and the headline is Franklin credit scandal hoax. And that is the only thing that you see on the Wikipedia about Franklin Credit. And it is basically just says in less than a paragraph that it is the result of an elaborate hoax that, that has been perpetrated. The satanic how, panic. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, okay, so, so, how, so how did, like, you know, and then, you know, like, or tarring it with, like, you know, uh, instances of the satanic panic, like the McMartin preschool uh, uh, um, hysteria, I mean, which was a hoax, which are not a hoax, it was, you know, but it wasn't real. Okay, how how like how how did how did this come to pass and like how like how is like w- you know Wikipedia is this kind of like public clearinghouse of information and and knowledge like I mean like certainly certainly there is enough documentation to suggest that at the very least uh, what what's being alleged here is not or, or some if not all of it is not just made up or like or or how would such an elaborate hoax even be perpetrated at this point so like because you just like just just say briefly like or how did like the wikipedia or like the official clearinghouse of like public information come to deem this story as a hoax wikipedia um when you get into certain political things wikipedia uh, often takes a uh, a different stance than what is the reality now, if you go to the talk page on Wikipedia, there have been battles waged over that Wikipedia page. Battles. Um, there's pages and pages and pages and pages. Uh, but there are these custodians of that page that refuse to let any 
thing coherent and cogent about the Franklin scandal on that page. And on my website, nickbryant.com, I have there, I've got a, a blog where I talk about the problem with Wikipedia and I show the big battles that have been waged on Wikipedia. And I've gone all the way to the top of the Wikipedia uh, food chain and I've never been able to uh, change it. Now that page is locked with what, with what's there. And there's been myself and a number of people that have tried to make changes, but that uh, these quote unquote editors will always make that non, will always make the Franklin, quote unquote, Franklin allegations nonsensical. And, and here's the thing about that. Why are they still covering it up all these years later? This is 30 years later. Why are they still covering it up? Um, why are these editors still covering it up? Because I believe, and Epstein has proved this, that these intelligence uh, entities have pedof- uh, you know, run pedophile networks. And, and that is, so with Franklin, um, it's like you're on Omaha Beach on D-Day. They're not going to give you an inch. Uh, these editors are not going to give you an inch because they want to keep that narrative as ridiculous and constricted as possible. And that Wikipedia page has costed me probably a lot of money um, because I've come very close to having some success in Hollywood with this story, but people in Hollywood don't read books um, or uh, they just, maybe some, maybe there's two or three people in Hollywood that read books. I don't know, but um, they just go to the Wikipedia page and then they don't read the Franklin scandal. And th- this is kind of interesting. I was, um, it was about 12 years ago and I was in Hollywood or LA pitching the Franklin scandal. And a friend of mine hooked me up with these two young, hungry movie executives. And I gave them each, I met them and I gave them each a copy of the Franklin scandal. And then my, my, and my friend had known them for a number of years. And then my friend sent me a email exchange that they had had. And they were discussing what was true and what wasn't true about the Franklin scandal. And they had never read it. So, <laughs> and then thrown the Wikipedia page and, um, and then I'm dead in the water. Well, I mean, just like for someone who's uh, researched this as uh, deeply as you have, like for the, for these editors engaging in these battles, I mean, what's the thing that they hang their hat on to label this a hoax um, or a they, conspiracy theory? Th- that's what they say it is. And if you look at the, if you, if you go to the talk and you'll see, or else you can go to my website and I've got a blog, The, the Trouble with Wikipedia, where I show ex- excerpts, um, they control it. And I've actually... I spent a, a lot of time at one point. I had some time. And uh, and then there were other people that wanted to change it. And these guys would not budge an inch. And as I said earlier, as I went up the Wikipedia food chain, they were, uh, they were backed up. So that Wikipedia page has caused me, um, not only probably caused me, but it's just caused me a lot of pain because a lot of kids were uh, molested in that Franklin network and for Wikipedia to be like that is just terrific. But was any, like, were you ever, has anyone ever supplied a justification or counter evidence or counter claims that would, that would, that would justify their, their, the sort of blockade of the, of, of this, of, of this story? They, they quote the mainstream media. And oh, that's it. Yeah. And the mainstream, according to the mainstream media, this was uh, the mainstream media went with the judiciary, a carefully crafted hoax. It was quite a cover up. I mean, and Epstein too has been quite a cover up. I was, what's kind of troubled me though is I thought that if a Franklin happened today with the internet, that we could get to the bottom of it. And the Epstein network happened, and I got Epstein's black book in 2012. I could not get anybody to do anything with it until 2015. And that was with Gawker and we put it up on, on the web. So um, this is the Epstein network has been covered up in broad daylight in the middle of America. And um, I find that extremely troubling. All right. I think, uh, I think that's a good place to leave it. Uh, Nick Bryant, uh, the book is the Franklin scandal. Uh, Nick, if people would like to read uh, more of your reporting or listening to your, listen to your podcast is coming out. Um, what should they do? 
you can go to my website, nickbryantnyc.com, and uh, we've got a podcast link there. And then you can follow me on Twitter, Nick, uh, double underspace, uh, Bryant. And I've got a, I've written another book about sexual political blackmail, as I said earlier, um, The uh, Confessions of a DC Madam. And I've got a book coming out this July about Watergate. And one of the things that people don't understand about Watergate is a major part of Watergate was the CIA sexual blackmail operation. And, um, and I really elucidate that in this book and I've got a tremendous amount of corroboration on it. And, um, and that book will be out in July and that's called the truth about Watergate, a tale of extraordinary lies and liars. Okay. Uh, Nick Bryant, thank you so much for your time. The book is the Franklin scandal. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you.